We've got Jeremiah Grossman, founder and CTO of White Hat Security. We've got Michael Coates, director of security assurance at Mozilla. Chris Evans leads the Google Chrome security team. Adam Meehan is the security program manager at Google. Zane Lackey is here from Etsy, and Alex Rice is representing the product security team at Facebook. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Bug Bounty program. I'm uh, really excited about this panel, actually, because it represents uh, pain for bugs, pain for vulnerabilities that we know all of our websites have. And it's actually one of the more uh, controversial niche subjects out there. And I think it's something more and more companies uh, can and probably should do as we move forward, as we learn more and more about our software, as we learn more and more about our SDLs and how they can be imperfect. So there is a very few, precious few forward-looking companies out there, and these guys represent most of them out there, that are willing to stick their necks out there and pay for vulnerabilities to voluntarily invite outsiders that they don't know to look in their publicly facing websites for vulnerabilities and all that risk, and then pay them for finding those particular issues. Go try to ask that of your average large bank somewhere like sometime about that. So this subject is a... Uh, All right, cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so we got some, uh, the guys that actually start, have started and run these programs. So you are going to be uh, encouraged to answer, uh, ask questions as we go of these guys. If you're looking to learn about bug bounty programs, looking to start them, these are the guys to ask. There's no one better in the entire world. Uh, to kick things off, so I got a couple of questions to start off with. And then by all means, you can ask. And when you don't, I'll keep asking until these guys get sick of me or whatever. But in the meantime, we're going to have a, a couple of slides run through real quick just to get some data on the screen and start the discussion that way. Thanks for that, uh, Jeremiah. So uh, I'm actually going to start with the, the kind of conclusion here that uh, a lot of us will probably get to. So I hope you don't mind me ruining the surprise. Um, when you pay people for bugs, you get more bug reports, and when you get more bug reports, you're able to fix more bugs, and your users are generally happier. And they're happier because they're more secure, and they actually haven't had to do anything or trade anything for that. So that's always a, a little bit of a win there. A couple of data points. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is our graph of the amounts that we paid out per month since we launched the program back in November of 2010. Uh, the reason why I'm showing the, the dollar amounts here rather than the raw number of bugs is that it's really quite a good proxy for the severity of those issues, right? The, the dollars that you're paying kind of match up with both the, you know, the number of bugs times the do dollars paid. So you can see we had this, this huge spike and then it's kind of been tailing off here towards the end. Um, and uh, I think this means a couple of things. One, that we're actually fixing bugs more quickly than we're introducing bugs. That's a good thing. Or at least the new bugs that are being introduced are less severe than the bugs that we're fixing. Or perhaps that the new bugs that are being introduced are just harder to find and they take more time so people are less likely to invest in actually getting them. So uh, one thing you will see though is we had this big spike. Uh, and it's not that we actually launched a new product that was chock full of holes and we uh, uh, paid out on a lot of bugs. We actually just recalibrated the amounts we were paying. Uh, as an example for Gmail, we tripled the amount that we were paying out and at our top tier we actually multiplied it by a factor of six. So we just started paying out more, that's why you see that spike towards the end there. I just want to quickly show this is our reward structure, what we pay. I know uh, not everyone else on the panel has a page like this. Uh, I just want to call out a few details here. We have a ton of different web origins, many different applications. And given that most of our bugs are XSS, paying different amounts depending on the value of that origin makes sense. Accounts.google.com is our most important. This is our login page uh, where people, you know, their password gets auto-filled if they use a password manager. Highly sensitive services, this is the usual stuff you might expect, Gmail, um, Wallet, Google Play, things like that. Normal Google applications, this is everything else, YouTube, Blogger, and so forth. Uh, and then the non-integrated acquisitions. These tend to have fewer users, less valuable data, and we really want people to focus more at the top end up there. So I'm sure it surprises no one to see that the majority of bugs that we get are cross-site scripting bugs. Uh, in terms of the everything else, cross-site request forgery is probably the most. Uh, then we have a bunch of things like uh, mixed scripting issues. Occasionally we'll get click jacking for some uh, important pages. 
Um, and then just kind of this big miscellaneous long tail of, of issues. But XSS is, is number one. So uh, where are the reports coming from? So this is a heat map based on the amounts paid out, the total amounts paid out in the country where we actually send the money. Germany is number one. Uh, US is right up there. Uh, we see a really strong following in Israel, uh, Japan, uh, Russia as well. Um, so it's interesting, given the purchasing power of you know, US $500 or $1,000, it's actually countries that are relatively wealthy. So, so the bar is partly about having the skill not just the time to go and find these bugs. Uh, I haven't really checked this in a while, but I think this generally holds true. We get about 80% of our really good bugs from a small number of people, about 20%. Uh, and in fact, if you take that low, we probably get like 60% of our bugs from you know, 10%. So, so there really is a long tail of people that report bugs, maybe one or two, but at the top end, our most valuable vulnerability reporters re report an absolute ton of awesome stuff. <coughs> So one quick cheesy bit of stock photography before I finish up, and we're, we're very happy with our reward program. Uh, we get more bug reports, good for our users, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's important to note that these programs don't replace you know, the, the, the security reviews that we do, the internal audits, uh, all of the templating and auto-escaping frameworks that we utilize to try and minimize these bugs. It, it, it's really something you do when you get everything else right and you build on top of those things. It, it's a great cherry on top but it does not make a full security uh, assurance program in and of itself. So yeah, just a, a brief intro to kick things off. I'll just minimize this. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm Alex Rice. I run the product security team at Facebook, and it's our team that's responsible for the, the bounty program on, on Facebook's side. Um, you'll hear from a, a slightly different uh, Google program on, on the Chrome side, they're, they're split between the, the web bugs and the Chrome side. Um, at, at, at Facebook, our program's all wrapped up into, into one large product because we don't have those, those clear product lines between, uh, between groups. Um, our, our program's uh, younger, a bit younger than the Google program. We've been going for uh, coming up on uh, a year and a half now. Uh, just last month, we passed half a million dollars in, in payouts going out, which is uh, which is a pretty cool number when it when you when you really stop to to think about where that money's going, and uh, the, we like to really focus on the the bounty program, like making your product more secure, and we're we're fixing bugs and users are happy. But uh, the bounty program for us really started as recognition to researchers. It was it was an extension of the responsible disclosure policy that we already had on our site, where people are coming and submitting bugs to us naturally, and we. But before we started paying money, we had a, a number of different ways we would try to show recognition for people who were actually helping Mike make the product better without, uh, without the actual monetary rewards. But the, the rewards really changed the dynamic of how these people are coming to your site and how frequently they're going to, to come back and, and, and submit new bugs. That that five hundred, uh, sorry, that uh, half a million, five hundred thousand is uh, split between about two hundred people across thirty different countries, which is which is not a lot, not a large number of people. Like it's it's a pretty small set of researchers who are coming to help make your your product better, and those two hundred people are not doing it entirely because of the money. Like most of them are there because because there's something that they care about, either in your product or some technical aspect of your product that is interesting and challenging or educational. And that's, that's one of the really subtle benefits of having a program like this, is you're engaging one of the most active user bases that you have in a, in a very, very meaningful way. Um, we've, uh, we've slowly expanded the, the scope of the program based on, on feedback of, of what we learned as, as we went along. Um, we started out with a pretty uh, limited scope of what we would accept, accept bugs for, and the, the, the bar initially was basically uh, any vulnerability that could potentially impact uh, user data on, on the main Facebook.com product, and because that's that's what we most that's what we cared about the most to, to start with. Like that that was the value for us. But as, as time went on, we started to get bugs submitted across uh, a wider range of areas there, and. Going back to our, our original goal in launching the program is to 
facilitate people who are trying to do research into whatever it is that's interesting to them, interesting to them about your product. And that, that's not always user-facing facing product folks. Um, so we expanded the scope of our program to ex include some third-party stuff and then eventually ended up at the point where we included all our, all our infrastructure. So the, the corporate side of things, um, things that uh, aren't necessarily touched by our, our normal users, and the, the scope now basically boils down to anything that Facebook is putting out on the internet anywhere on our IP space, whether or not it's a, a user-facing product or not. And that, that encourages uh, different skill sets to come uh, try to attack you that we weren't necessarily targeting in the original thing. It, it enables things like network penetration testers rather than uh, people just looking at, at web access. And uh, I, I, I feel like that's where these tend to naturally gravitate gravitate to is you start getting bug reports in wherever you have problems and um, going back to the original goal of supporting the researchers that's uh, it's a re really important to keep in mind and be flexible with whatever people have to be sending you away. Um, let's get into questions pretty soon I'll just pass this along <laughs> yeah let's continue that narrative let's, let's hear about the the, the the either from your perspective on the bounty programs and also yeah, just more about the general the general batting program itself. Or if, if you have more to add. I'm um, sorry, do you want me to just say something about the Chrome program? or you want to Yeah, like some of the highlights about it, just so people can get a feel for what the bounty program entails. Uh, sure, I'll just kick out a, a quick couple of stats from the Chrome program. Um, so I'm Chris Evans, uh, look after security of Google Chrome. Um, we launched our bounty program back in uh, January 2010, so it's been going a bit longer than our web program although the success of the Chrome program did feed into our decision to launch the web program. Um, we've had just short of 500 rewardable bugs as part of the Chrome program in that time. So that stat gives you an idea that if you sort of launch a program and stick with it, that's the sort of level of benefit you can get. 500 bugs that we, we've been eliminated, have been eliminated from the Chrome browser that may otherwise have you know, existed without this program. So that sort of a raw figure of improvement. Um, total payouts, about three quarters of a million dollars. That includes... Uh, Rewards for bugs, and more recently, um, we've introduced a more competition-like format called Ponium, and that, that pays out very large payouts, but for, for, for a very hard piece of work. Um, I think uh, I'm saying like you run the, the program at Etsy. Um, we're probably the, the newest program here by far. We launched about a month and a half ago or so. Um, and just kind of stats-wise, we've I think we've paid out around 25,000 or so. Um, and really, I mean, a couple of things Alex said, I just want to reiterate real fast of uh, a lot of, you feel that a lot of the, the, the driving force behind a lot of the researchers is not necessarily the money. Um, in fact, just to kind of underscore that, a couple of the best bugs that we got were when we just had the responsible disclosure page and we hadn't launched the bug bounty yet, um, which really feeds back into what I feel that we're all trying to do with, with our bug bounty programs or one of the things we're trying to do, which is just reward researchers who are doing good work. And that's the reason why when we launched our bug bounty program, we went back and actually retroactively applied it to people who had reported vulnerabilities uh, from the start of our start of our responsible disclosure page. Hey, I'm uh, Michael Coates uh, at Mozilla. Uh, we're pretty proud to have started our bounty program for Firefox uh, eight years ago in 2004. So I consider us one of the, the first people venturing in that space aside from a few other really tiny maybe newspapers that did it first. The, the history is kind of interesting. Uh, so we've done this since 2004. Uh, originally we started this and still maintain uh, that the goal is to encourage security research in the space. Uh, if we think the security industry is understaffed now, you know, think about that in 2004. And uh, so it's definitely serving that purpose. Uh, you'll find, I think, through this discussion that uh, everyone, I'm guessing, at least Mozilla, highly uh, thinks this is a great idea. Bounties are fantastic. I mean, we've been through the ups and downs. There's lots of things we've learned. But it, in the end, it encourages research, and it ends up with users being more secure. And, uh, and that's a huge win. Uh, in terms of statistics, uh, we started back in 2004 just paying $500 to start the program for bug. Uh, around 2010, we jumped that up to 3,000. I think we've paid uh, just under 700,000 in the last few years. Uh, and we have that both for uh, Firefox and for our web properties. So we started the web properties back at the end of 2010. You know, again, led by the success of seeing Firefox with the ultimate goal of protecting users. And I think similar to some of the stats we saw on the screen earlier, you know, pretty good distribution around the world. Uh, Europe is definitely rocking pretty well with about 50% of our submissions. 
uh, and some uh, smatterings throughout the rest of the world. Uh, so I'll leave it that for now. We'll dive in. Sure. So it, you guys strike me as a the initial champions of the bug bounty programs, and at some point you decide it's a good idea, and you have to bring it up to the business on let's and let's implement this. And this, you know, bug bounty program is an idea that's been floated out there a lot. And there's always these horror stories that we can't do that because it'll bring down the site. We can't do that because it'll en encourage bad behavior and a, something to do with black market economics and vulnerability research. So uh, my question is really, what resistance did you encounter when you decided this is a good idea and it's something we should be doing? Uh, yeah, so when we, um, we had the success of the Chrome program to build on, so people were, had some level of comfort, but taking it to live web applications that have live user data was something that we had to, to sell to people. Um, fu fundamentally, though, one thing we got a sense of is that as an organization, you have to, you have to appreciate getting bugs. You know, when a bug report comes in, do you say, cool, this is an opportunity to fix something, or do you say, Let's call the PR people uh, and see how we can kind of try and downplay this. And so culturally, as a whole organization, we were appreciative of, of, of those bug reports. Um, there was a little bit of that element of unknown. Uh, that was a big part of it, is like, how many bugs are we going to get? Are we going to DOS ourselves? Are we going to be able to respond to them effectively? The cash was less of a concern than the resource constraints. Were we going to be able to handle it or drop the level of service that we already give to all the bug reporters that we already get? Instead of responding in one day, we'd go out to 10 days. Um, so the way we kind of mitigated that was just you know, building a really kind of rigorous and robust process, having good uh, um, everything in place, being able to scale up in terms of people that were committed to triaging those bugs and, and, and making sure we had the engineers on side uh, to fix them. And that, um, you know, we convinced people that it was, was worth trying. So did, uh, did you guys have similar experiences among you, or is there something different entirely? No resistance, a lot of resistance, a lot of selling? I'd add to that a, a, a little bit, because I, I really want to underscore what he just said, which is the most important part in getting a bug bounty program out, is being able to respond to, to bugs that come out. Like, that is the most challenging part uh, across all organizations, and especially across any other ones. But, um, you have to have buy-in from engineering to get bugs fixed. And so when I, when I start thinking about how you would go about getting into a program, I, I wouldn't start out with a, with a bounty program. I'd, I'd encourage you to launch a responsible disclosure policy, and let a few security bugs come in naturally and see, see what happens and see how you can handle them and start getting a feel for how quickly you can get your engineering teams to, to fix, fix bugs. And I, I, I mention that because most people have bugs that they escalate internally because like some, some internal pen tester or something found it and um, you, you have a pretty good idea for how long it will take you to fix a bug that you report yourself internally. But when, when it's coming from somebody outside and you're not entirely sure what they're going to do with it or how long they're going to uh, keep quiet and happy about it, it really changes the, the, the dynamics across the organization. And that's the most important thing to, to test and really get streamlined before you start going down this route. So the uh, second part of your question was regarding black market. And I think that is an area that some people will see as resistance. Uh, the basic question being, how are you competing with the black market? You know, we've heard stats like uh, vulnerabilities can go from 50, 100,000, you know, a million dollars, depending on what that is on the black market. How will your bounty program that's, you know, 500, 3,000 or whatever compete with that? And I think it's interesting to frame that question correctly in your mind. And, and really the answer to that is you're not competing with the black market. It, what you're doing is targeting a different market of people that, are, that don't want to be part of that. If you think of a, an individual in a university that wants to get into security and is dabbling with you know, research, if, if they find an issue in your site, there's a pretty big uphill climb for them to then take that and seek out the black market. We've heard about it, but what, what does that mean? You don't call 1-800-BLACK MARKET very easily. Uh, and, then, and then say you do sell it to the black market. You're going to get $100,000. They ask you for your bank account. Okay, you're going to hand over your bank account info to this black market group. Uh, there's, there's a huge barrier to entry and a lot of different moving parts. But on the other side, we provide a legitimate route where somebody can go and not worry about crime with the individuals you're associating with. They can get recognition, they can use it to build their skills, and get a fair amount of money. Um, some of the people that we pay, depending on where they are in their world or where they are in their career, that amount of money is pretty significant, and they, they do well by uh, getting those nice. Uh, uh, just to take a moment, are there, does anybody have any questions before I move on? Is there any questions? Yes. Yep, definitely. Yes. Uh, with that question, I just to reiterate, has he hired researchers? 
<laughs> yes. Uh, uh, three, really. Cool. So it's a rec so it's a recruiting tool for you guys. <laughs> Not that you would need AppSec people, really. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes. I'd like to say uh, about a line here because uh, I'm traveling all the way from India. I'm speaking to it. And uh, most of my expense to travel to the US is the first time I've come to the US. Most I, I use the money from Mozilla uh, program. Is that the question? What, 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 uh, where are the researchers from, the emerging countries where they're from? Where, where do you think is the new country where we're going to start seeing more and more vulnerable? Like vulnerable reports, you mean? Yeah. Okay. So we, we see a lot of reports from, from India. We don't actually pay out all that much. So we tend to see a lot of reports that are either don't end up qualifying because they don't meet the severity threshold. Um, but I think the, the enthusiasm and the energy is right there. Uh, and I think over time, as, as the skills continue to increase, I think that will be a, a, a big market. So it, we've, uh, you've yet mentioned that you've had researchers from really all over the world. How are you handling the logistics of paying these guys? This can't be trivial. <laughs> I think it... Uh, <laughs> I think it may depend what size organization you are. Like um, Google's quite a large company, so there are some internal processes already for me to just piggyback on to, to, to pay anyone anywhere. Uh, yeah, I did to speak like right into the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, is that working? Very good. Um, so what, what Chris was saying, and I, I, I'll echo the exact same thing, which is it really depends on the size of the organization that you have. Like Google, it sounds like, has very strong internal infrastructure to piggyback on, um, like uh, ways to pay people through AdWords and check out, that's how I imagine that works. It was, uh, uh, that's the first route we started going down at, at Facebook, and we don't quite have that internal infrastructure to readily available to just pay money to people anywhere in the world. Um, so it actually ended up being quite a large hassle to go figure out how to, how to pay people. And the biggest hassle with it is figuring out how to do taxes for people, which means you're like actually now collecting uh, W-9 forms and W-8 BN forms and social security numbers and EINs and all types of scary numbers that you don't really want to, <laughs> want to be asking security professionals for. Um, but at, at, at the end of the day, I think that's, while it's one of the more tricky aspects of it, it's not this roadblock that you're going to hit. Like the reality, you can probably find someone in your accounting or finance department who can help out with that. Um, we, we started out with uh, using PayPal and Western Union for everybody and quickly hit a lot of problems there with our PayPal accounts getting <laughs> shut down and <laughs> Western Union putting fraud alerts on us. And it, yeah, it looks a little suspicious when you're sending out a bunch of money to random people in <laughs> Eastern Europe and India. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, we ended up switching to uh, these uh, reloadable debit cards from, from Chase. Basically, uh, it's relatively straightforward to get your own credit cards printed through through uh, any major bank. Um, there are... There are Positives and negatives to that. The, the, main, the main positive side from our perspective is you can very quickly get money to people once they have the card. You just put more money on it and they just have money right away. Um, the, the downsides are there's, it's not quite the same as cash. There's small fees associated with like using a, an ATM card at, at an ATM, like two to three dollars, which is something that we try to compensate for on, on the other side. Um, but but at the end of the day, it's uh, not some insurmountable problem. Yeah. Any, uh, any other questions? Yeah. So what, what do you guys think about creating like an industry coalition group, something more formal where researchers can coordinate through some central authority that people that are paying bug bounties can also coordinate that stuff. So, you know, there's stuff that pop ahead maybe sharing payments, uh, sharing information about who's reporting what bug to whom and what kind of research they're doing. Uh, 
an environment where researchers collaborate and they work together and talk about techniques and share. What, what do you think about creating something more formal rather than what it is now, which is kind of like everybody's doing their own thing and yeah, we talk about it, but we don't really have anything around it. So I, I think the interesting model to look at for that is how people do responsible disclosure now. And every company has a security app mailing list and that's any attempts in the past to, to centralize things like that haven't really panned out. I would, um, I don't know, I, I, I would try to look at that as the closest model to it before that and I think there's a lot of good reasons why people maintain their own security contact forms before uh, for this. And this is really just an extension of whatever your security contact form is in the first place. Yeah, it also sounds very similar to the ZDI model, um, if you're familiar with that. Uh, a ZDI is kind of a third party system that pays their researchers for vulnerabilities and turns around and provides them to companies at some point and has a profit model of some sort that I won't attempt to explain. The concerns with adding another step in the process is in the overall goal of protecting users, it can slow things down. Um, while ZDI may give us vulnerability information, we would love to get it directly from the researcher purely because we can get it faster and fix our users faster, because that's our goal. Uh, and then setting up a, a middleman would also be a little tricky just from a, a trust perspective. I mean, it's the most sensitive data you have, so extending that trust zone to another group would be challenging. But I do like your idea of building a community to just, again, encourage research, which we're totally for. It's worth noting that some of the guys that, um, that report bugs to both Google programs have formed little communities of their own by sort of finding each other on Twitter and sharing like fuzz targets in the case of a browser or, or XSS techniques in the case of a website. Um, and it's quite, it's quite fun seeing them sort of find each other and collaborate. And, and certainly if people were looking to start up a program and wanted some, you know, at least advice or, or discussion about process and procedures, um, I think, you know, a lot of us all actually talk before launching our programs, even though some of us, you know, are technically rivals, I guess, in, in some respects. You know, we, <laughs> technically, uh, we, you know, we, security teams, I think, often can rise above that and still uh, share, share information to make it work better for everyone. There is the, uh, I guess, the opposing question that comes up a lot. Um, you're investing a lot of dollars in your bug padding programs. Why aren't you instead just investing these dollars into your SDL programs instead? You know, make a better SDL and we won't have to pay for bugs in production. I think the answer is, if you really care about security, you do both. So anyone that runs a security program will know that no matter what you do, there's always some percentage of things you will miss. It, there's no way to be perfect. And that's how I, you know, when I've heard this question before, I've restated it. I, mean, I would love to invest more money earlier in the life cycle and be perfect and have nothing ever slip through. But I haven't found that correct dollar amount. Um, <laughs> But what we do have is a system with you know, multiple checks and balances and a way to leverage a much larger community that wants to help you know, push the end goal of security. Uh, so we do, we do both, just like, just like was said. Um, but this is just another step. And if you're not doing this, somebody's finding those bugs, they're just not telling you. So consider, consider that when you think about a bank program. I mean, I, I can see there's an argument to be made that it makes more sense for people who are in the cloud and the cost for us for fixing a bug that exists in production is much lower than, for example, Adobe or Microsoft or, or Oracle. Um, you know, I guess we also have a couple of browser vendors up here though, but they have excellent auto update mechanisms, um, which I think is a, is a factor there. So I, I think it's no surprise that the people that are running bug bounty programs at this stage are the ones that can push quickly and cheaply and easily. I'll just add one quick thing to think about. Let's say, um, let's say you have a security team of, uh, of you know, say 20 very talented individuals. Um, so think of their own bugs they can find before release. And then imagine if the Indonesian learning have opened up for this bug bounty program to the world, there are thousands of talented individuals who might come and, come and help secure your product. So it's just a it's kind of numbers at some stage. I mean, and why is it so, 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 so that's the one to, to press it on that one a little bit. I, I would have thought the same thing, but the numbers seem to play out differently, that there's thousands of people who can try, but it seems like there's a real shortage of AppSec people. It also seems to clump. Most of the bugs are found by a small set of people, and it also seems like, since you guys seem to share data, are, the same, are, is it diff, are you seeing different researchers find bugs in your products and services, or the same ones, or what's the overlap there? there there's two very 
broad angles to that. There are a small set of people who are like, I, 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 would, I would say, doing this for a living and really like hitting the programs all over the place and trying to find like the maximum number of bugs. And then there's a, there's a smaller number of people that are focused in like very specific areas of the of in, the individual products that um, tend to find the the higher quality bugs, the the more interesting bugs, and it there there's like there's very much very clearly a place for both of those uh, for the, of those skill sets, and so while the while on the one side the people who are really good at producing a high volume of bugs uh, tend to tend to be a pretty small community that's spread across all, all the properties. The people who are, uh, the, 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 the long tail of that, who find like the very interesting bugs, who do like very deep dive research into very specific components of your site, um, th those tend to not spread out across your products. And e even, even in our own program, those people will focus on very specific parts of Facebook rather than, uh, rather than uh, branch out all over the place. One thing we've seen over the years is uh, we have a number of people that are continually involved, but we get about 15 to 20 percent churn. And uh, I think we attribute that to people that have tried research techniques that have worked for a while and then kind of dry up. But also it shows that more people are coming into the program. So we're continuing to grow, you know, talented security people, which is part of the goal. There's, there's lots of definite overlap, though. I look at their, like, Hall of Fame, and I recognize almost every name. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's same, same goes for us. Any questions? Questions? Yes, sir. What kind of analysis have you done on pricing values? And also, do you have any metrics for the changes of pricing or variety of pricing? Like, how does it increase the tax gains? Are people that aren't important on the road? Have you seen people in private companies? So the, the, the short answer is we've all changed our pricing structure since, since we've started. Um, in, in us in particular, we tend to fluctuate what we'll pay on individual bounties based on how difficult we think they are to export at that point in time. Um, so th there's times when uh, XSS was, was higher at the beginning than it is now, so we're paying more for XSS now than we were when we, when we first launched the program um, because most of the, the low-hanging XSS has, has been just eradicated at this point. Um, uh, we've always had a very strong CSRF framework in place. So from the beginning, CSRF pays, uh, like on, on paper it looks like it pays better than the other ones, but that's just because they're much more difficult to find in Facebook. And that's just an individual analysis you need to do on, on your own product, which is really goes back to the, the reward and re recognition part, which is how much effort did this person put into to finding this vulnerability. And that's going to be different across every single product line. Um, on, on top of that baseline per vulnerability, we, uh, we, we pay bonuses on top of bounties, which is not, not the most transparent process. It basically boils down to us yelling around the room, which is like, how cool was that bug? And just <laughs> bumping it up based on the, the, the cool factor of it, which may be um, like new research or an area where we didn't think a bug was possible or a, a new exploit technique or something like that. And that, that's, that's in, an incredibly arbitrary thing and really boils down to uh, what, the, what the security team is impressed by. C certainly when we set the initial um, figures, we, we kind of just made them up, right? It, it, it's, it's very hard to, you know, we just did and then, and then we adjust over time based on what we're seeing and, and our, our big concern and why we publish our reward structure is to incentivize, to, basically it's our message to tell people what we care most about um, through, through the dollar figures and, and really encourage them to, to focus on those areas. And then as we find that bugs drop off in those areas, we would consider then increasing it. Because it's basically the more money that it, that's on offer, the more time people are probably prepared to invest looking, looking in that area. Um, so we really react to the bugs that we're seeing. And, and I think there's a part of your question about, you know, do we look at, say, scans or where people are testing? Not so much. We're more reactive of, like, what are the actual bug reports coming in and adjust on that. Is there another question? Sorry, in the back. I'll answer that very quickly. Uh, surprisingly little, much little, much fewer arguments than I expected. Um, partly for us because we, we give a guideline that we can point to and say this is the reason, but, and we also try and give them a, a real honest technical reasoning behind our decision. Uh, and also I think we've built up some credibility over time, certainly for our repeat bug reporters that 
you know, we, we do think about things and, and we've paid them in the past uh, a reasonable amount and here's the reason why we didn't do it. We expected a lot more pushback uh, and we don't get that much. Yeah, I think, I think a key on that too is just explaining in plain language, like, we made this call because of this, like, here's why. And when you kind of put that out there and don't just say, oh, here's a, here's a number that we arbitrarily assigned. You say, like, hey, uh, it was you know, this category of issue. We found, like, we, we think that it's worth this because of this. Or here's the reward we've assigned because of this reason. And just be as transparent as you can with researchers. Uh, we've been pretty shocked by how cool everybody is about that. Yeah, one big key there is to uh, have it clearly documented publicly. Um, so they don't think you're just making it up every time, even if you are clear about it. Um, because then you can point back and say, this is you know, what we tried to guide people on, this is what it means if it was unclear. And it, we've had good responses to that. A, a quick question to poll the audience. How many people are here are actually thinking about deploying a new bug bounty program? So, so a few of you, okay, cool. Um, the gentleman here, yes. Um, so I'm looking for the bug and the the argument I'm trying to get together before I approach my executive team is uh, I think the question is, how did you guys go forward and say, I'll open this up to the world to try to hack it, no matter what, and yeah, that's pay the money, so spend as much money aside for us to pay this back? Yeah, how'd you, how'd you budget starting off? So I, I think in a, the number of bugs you're going to, to get is probably pretty proportional to how big of a target you are. And you have a lot of control over how big of a target you are based on, sorry, you have a lot of inherent knowledge of how big of a target you are based on how many bugs are coming in naturally through your existing uh, disclosure policy, which I would, I would cycle back to make sure you have one of those in place first. So you can use that as your initial baseline and try to uh, extrapolate from there of how much that's going to increase. Um, you also have a lot of control over what you set bounties at. So there's a, there's a lot of much smaller, there's a number of far smaller bounty programs on, on the internet that pay uh, between five to $50 for, for vulnerabilities. And um, if, if you're concerned about budget issues, start off with that. Like start off with something that's considerably lower and, uh, and map from there. And you, using us as a big, in, in the grand scheme of things, at half a million dollars in our security budget is, is not much. Um, it might be depending on the size of the company, but you can easily match that up to what you're expecting to do there. And um, some, something else I would, I would throw out there is uh, put a, consider putting a cap on it. Like we have $100,000 in bounties to pay out this year and like the first 20 people to report it, get it. And um, I, I don't think you would get much pushback from the community with a program like that if like budget is the constraining factor and you're in an organization where you, you have to have a very clearly defined budget around what you're gonna pay. Uh, yeah, so uh, given that finding bugs or getting bugs reported into a bug bounty program is indicating areas where you are failing, how do you take that information and use that bounty on yourself to make sure you're talking to the right bugs? I think the, you, you answered the question with, with your own thing, but it's uh, make sure you are doing that. <laughs> it's, uh, it, that's going to look different across whatever the vulnerability category is and whatever, whatever your team is, but absolutely we look at the, oh, great, yeah. I'm glad you all approved. Yeah. <laughs> we, we absolutely look at the vulnerabilities that are coming in and do an analysis on why that vulnerability existed in the first place. And the, there's, there's a long range of issues for why that might be, but you, you can absolutely identify failures in your SDL. Yeah, we've just, just a little bit more on that. We've started doing uh, a lot more work on looking at every discrete vulnerability, particularly around XSS, and categorizing the root cause and then using that to drive um, uh, specific changes further down the chain and also mapping the trends there because it's, it's, it's actually a really good way of, of, of kind of mapping trends because other bug sources are kind of inconsistent, like internal pen tests or, or whatever. This is kind of this nice reasonably consistent set of bugs that are always coming in. So it, it, the trends tend to uh, hold some value in that respect. Yes, sir. So, 
So, so to just to restate the question, this, the question is around scope. You define scope in one area, but the bug bounty guy finds one at a scope and then reports it. Now what? So th there's there's. Yes, we have we have one out of the scope. But the, the two things that I would say to that is the first one is just being like as tra transparent as possible up front. That, that's a common threat trend across all the different things you're going to hit. And you're like you need to be transparent across across this. Um, we we did break our policy a number of times before we launched the infrastructure side of things, just because we did get cool bugs that were outside of scope, and we wanted to recognize the researcher. And that's uh, that's that's the goal of the program. And so like you can absolutely bend scope on it. Um, the main reason people are going to look at doing scope is this philosophy that um, you're going to somehow steer people towards there and everything else is going to be off limits. Uh, that's absolutely the wrong mindset to go down. Like, it, just because you set the scope for the bounty program, you are going to have researchers hitting other areas and have that expectation. And the, the, they're probably going to be doing it anyway, even if you don't watch a bounty program. So, oh, 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 I was just going to add something um, sort of to reinforce Alex's comments, which is I noted a culture of sort of tending towards looking for an excuse to pay the researcher as opposed to looking for a reason or an excuse to not pay the researcher. And we also have that culture. Um, and that will really help your relationships with the community. Um, and one other quick note on scope. Uh, scope is a good way to limit, say, if you've got budget concerns. You, could, you can start by launching small. So when we launched the web program, Initially, we scoped just a few of our websites that we were more concerned with, and we opened that over, over time. So that's one way you can mitigate budget concerns, perhaps. Uh, James. So I, I, I think Facebook's probably a very unique environment in that aspect, in that the, the product security team is all security engineers who are committing code on a, on a regular basis and it is very tied in with the engineering team. Um, I, I, I don't expect that to be the norm across all products. It, it's the case with Chrome, um, but probably not everyone else. The other one. <laughs> and, um, does does anyone else want to? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, so the members that look at it for our for our bounty consists of people from the security assurance team. So we're not necessarily committing code um, to Firefox or to our websites uh, very often. Uh, instead, we're, you know, we're analyzing the risk, looking through the proof of concept. In situations where it's unclear if what they're saying is true and proof of concept isn't right, then you work with developers. Um, but by having the same group of people <coughs> kind of review those in different uh, bounty triage meetings, it, it provides consistency sure. and it works very well. So, so just, a, just a quick final question, just a few comments. Uh, who are bug bounty programs good for? And how, what guidance would you give to somebody, I, I guess uh, uh, Alex did a little bit first, but who are bug bounty programs for and who are they definitely not for? Uh, just echo my answer from earlier. Put a, put a responsible disclosure policy out there. Let a few bugs come in. Um, if you're pretty confident that you can resolve those in a reasonable amount of time, you should probably launch a bug bounty. Um, if you're not yet in that place, you should probably be in that place anyway, but I would make your first goal being quick remediation of bugs and some way for researchers to interact. Is that a consistent answer? Yeah, it's for organizations that prefer to know about bugs rather than not. <laughs> <laughs> so for the detractors, that's, they, you pretty much assign them to where they are. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank our panelists here for expressing themselves. And, uh, Thank you very much for the questions. Appreciate it.